Okay, so I ended up really having to break it off there in the middle of perceiving objects and scenes. We were talking about the Gestalt principles of um, perceptual organization, and some of these principles also influence um, how we segregate the perceptual scene. So how do we determine figure, what is what is the figure or the thing that I'm looking at from the ground, from the background? And in this picture, I think the ubiquitous kind of, you've probably seen it in several psychology classes, to where you're going back and forth and you can't stop going back and forth, if you feel like me, between the faces and the and the vase. And what happens is, so if I'm looking at the, the vase and that's popping out as the figure, then that is, it is the, the thing that is thing-like. And so the background becomes uh, just un, this kind of unformed background. It is, it gets the outline. Okay, it is the thing that is memorable, at least for those of us in um, Western society. I'm going to show you what I think is a really interesting difference in um, uh, cultural psychology and why it is, it's different. It's difficult to generalize sometimes. Uh, it is, it is the thing and the background is kind of the unformed background. And then I always have this slide next, which gives the words on a slide of, of everything that I just said. And I make sure that I didn't miss anything. So the figure is in front. It is the thing that is thing-like. It's more memorable. And the outline belongs to the figure. The ground is, the, the background is unformed. And that is uh, clear here, where instead of a more ambiguous picture, we have a figure where it's difficult to distinguish figure from ground. And once you, some of it is ambiguous, but once you see um, a horse kind of pop out from the background, then it becomes more thing-like and more memorable and, and all of that. And then the background changes. Uh, before, that horse over to the far right was probably part of the background, but as soon as you noticed, oh, the, the horse over far to the right with the white, with the white head yeah, that's, that's, that's a figure now, and it changes. But this is something I've added for after teaching uh, research methods because uh, they have a, this um, generalizing the results, and they talk briefly about cultural psychology, a really a special case of when we try to generalize results. And, you know, a lot of social psychology, it's interesting to me how much of how much social psychology, when we look at those questions in different um, societies, that we get similar results compared to actually one of the things that differs quite a bit. I mean, social psychology does too, but a lot of the, um, um, you know, listening to authority and um, going along with the group, that is, that is interestingly kind of across cultures uh, from what I can tell. But this the fact that we have these perceptual differences is fascinating to me because, again, if, if I'm going to go way back to the beginning of what I was saying, remember, everything is filtered through perception. Uh, so this example of figuring ground, I like to do this, uh, what do you notice first in this picture? And I'm giving you, you time to actually notice and think. And I usually get the fish, maybe the plants, maybe someone says, well, I noticed the fish and then I noticed that um, frog-like thing, you know, or maybe I noticed what looks like maybe a snail over there. So I asked you, what did you see and what did you notice? But um, if we think back of what that makes memorable for us, um, I'm going to show you that this is different in, in different cultures. So with accuracy being that, yes, they're asking the question, was this object, was this fish in the scene that you saw before? Okay, and they showed it with the original background. They showed it with a white background, or really no background. And then they showed it in a novel background. And look what's happened. So the results are over there in the figure on the left. Uh, for Japanese people, they are doing better than North American people when the fish is on the same background. But that trend flips, okay? We see an interaction where 
now with no background and with a novel background japanese people are doing worse than people from north america and this um, is suggesting that they not only see and remember the figure they see and remember the figure and ground as as more a holistic experience than than we do so there have been lots of studies that have asked this question of what factors are determining how we figure out the figure from the ground how we how we segregate the scene and if i ask you so this is one example and i've left out some that are in the book that are really cool but um I'm, we're kind of running behind so if i ask you in this one which is the figure and which is the ground in a think about what you first pull out as figure and now in b what seems like the figure And now you can see if your intuition uh, was really following along with the results that Vissera et al. found in 2002, that in A, there were a larger percentage of people saw the lower part of the scene as, as figure. And if you think about it, this makes sense for how we kind of look at the world and the ground of um, the trees and everything, and then the horizon, the upper part, that definitely seems more like background than whatever trees, ground, plants, um, buildings, whatever I'm looking at on the, at the lower part. Whereas on the left side um, in B, and they ask if, if left is seen as the figure, about that's about 50-50. So um, we don't have a real preference for left-right. Some of the gestalt properties of objects that have been found to determine to help us figure out what's the figure and what's the ground um, are symmetry. The smaller areas tend to be figures and the larger areas more unformed and ground. Uh, the orientation of lines or the orientation of things. And, the, and then, of course, meaningfulness, right? How, how meaningful is something to us? And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that not all of these are going to work. <laughs> not all of them have ever worked in any of my classes. I've been doing this since 2012, and I've, I've kept them in there because um, I think it's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to start with symmetry, and if I ask you in A, what is the figure, red or yellow? And usually if I take a poll and get a show of hands, I get about half the people saying red, half the people saying yellow, not quite half, like just a few people saying red, a few people saying yellow, but the same proportions. And then someone will say, it's weird, it's like it changes. And yes, that is the, that is what's happening in this picture. And, and it's pretty strong. Symmetry is pretty strong, and it usually works. So most of us take on the left side, those ones that are symmetrical um, are the red, and that looks like the figure, and then it flips to where on the right side, what is um, symmetrical, the same on both sides, is the yellow. If I ask you in B, is it the, um, he has cross here, but I'm going to say X, because cross is really um, ambiguous in my vocabulary. So the, the cross, or the, the X, or the plus figure? Which one seems more like the figure? And the idea here is that it, it should be the plus figure because that's the smaller area. That's one that almost has never worked. So I have a few people saying the smaller area, but I have a lot of people saying the, the X, the larger area. I keep looking for another example, but it's not an easy thing to find. And so I haven't replaced my, my bad example yet. And I have a similarly bad example for orientation because I'm going to do the same thing of um, plus or x the plus vertical horizontal cross or the x the tilted cross and here most people don't have any sense of either one or sometimes we all say pizza pie it looks like a pizza pie i mean it's really <laughs> it's hard to hard to say and uh that doesn't work so well but if you remember so we tend to see vertical and horizontal lines better in that kind of oblique effect we have more of our visual cortex responding to vertical and horizontal lines and we prefer our figure 
is going to more, be more likely to be those horizontal and, and vertical lines. And then this one works always, the meaningfulness, dark or light. Dark or light. And I'm going to guess that most of you are saying dark, but you really have to play my game here. This is a, uh, this, uh, all of objects and scenes is playing my game with me. I'm going to flip this around and just show you. It's not because it's, it's the darker. It's not that darker things are, um, tend to be the figure. It is because it is meaningful. So I flipped the whole thing upside down, dark or light. Yeah, for most of us, again, it's, it's the light, right? Because it's a thing that looks like a wave and that is meaningful for us. Another great example of uh, the effects of orientation and meaningfulness and how they work together, really, is something that I stole from Dr. Robin Morris. You'll notice that her name comes up a lot in this as I, I really uh, enjoyed some of her examples. And here, so... I'm just going to tell you what students, so this is the game that students are supposed to tell me what they see. I'm going to tell you what students have said before. They have said, um, weird tools used by Lego figures. <laughs> they have said, uh, oh, I can't remember what else they've said <laughs> for those black blotches. And then someone will say, oh, it's tie upside down. It's, it's tie upside down. And then I'll have people looking for a, an actual, like a cravat, like a, a tie that someone wears being, and they're like, I have no idea what, I don't, ha I don't know what that person is seeing. And now I'm going to flip that. Okay. I'm going to change the orientation and I'm going to make it meaningful. And most of us on the right very easily see tie, right? The word tie. And now if you flip your, if you go and look at the one on the left, you can see that that's flipped and it's upside down. And sometimes there are still people who are going, what are they talking about? It takes them a little while to see that that is the word tie upside down. So orientation and how, how this can affect meaningfulness. But what's important to us is, is it meaningful? And then I end this, this part of it with this, again, um, picture of the faces, which we talked about meaningfulness in uh, just perceiving objects. But if you'll notice, um, there are some rocks and trees that at first they are part of the background. Um, most of us I see the faces in the front before I even see the people on the horses, but there's, so there are a couple of faces in the trees in the background that um, are part of the background when we're focusing on the front or focusing on the people on the horses. And once we get that meaningfulness, once we notice the face, it changes, right? Now it is the, it is part of the figure and it's hard to actually go back and see it as background. Okay, we've been talking really about object perception, and we're going to talk about object perception in, within scenes, but first we're going to, we have to talk about scene perception. And I do this um, as, it's, it's really kind of an analogy as that figure is to ground, as object is to scene. So the object is compact, it's acted upon, usually what we remember from scenes are the, are the objects, the scene is extended, and it's acted within. So like the ground, it's more unformed. Mary Potter did a study back in 1976 where she gave people a target picture or a description. So you can see in this, um, she's showing a description, girl clapping. And then she flashed 16 pictures for 250 milliseconds. And now this, this millisecond timing is gonna become really important as we're talking here. Um, 250 milliseconds is a quarter of a second. So quite fast. And with a target picture, people were almost at 100% accuracy. So matching a, a picture to a picture is very easy. With a target description, so writing out girl clapping, we're still at about 90% accuracy. And again, that's with 250 milliseconds. And as we talk about this kind of thing, masking, 
um, it has masking as part of the study. And I'll talk about masking a couple times, but I'm hoping I'm going to explain it well enough here, where if I show a picture and there's then then I show a white space and I showed the picture for 250 milliseconds, you actually experience that picture for something more like 500 milliseconds because there is this iconic memory that's about 250, 350 milliseconds that you are still experiencing that visual information in raw form. But in this example, these pictures are acting as ma as pattern masks as we are changing this. This is truly a quarter of a second that they are getting the scene. So with this information as kind of background, uh, Fefe et al. 2007 presented scenes for times ranging from 27 milliseconds, so 25 milliseconds being something like um, two one hundredths or it's like one fiftieth of a second, like really short to 500 milliseconds, so a half a second. In those really brief durations at 27 milliseconds, all people would say would be able to say is where the light and dark areas were. At 67 milliseconds, they could identify larger objects. And by 500 milliseconds, they were identifying smaller objects. And here again, we're at a half a second. We have our, our pattern masks. And the so they're really only getting a half a second. So how are we getting the gist of a scene and that allowing us to identify the smaller objects within a scene. So Oliva and Taralba have told us a great deal about perceiving the gist of a scene. And actually, we're going to see their names a few times here in semantic regularities and, and so forth, as they've done a lot of work in this area. Um, and they realize that one of the things that's helping us perceive the gist of a scene are these global image features, Okay, that we are perceiving very rapidly, they are very holistic, they're giving us a holistic view of the scene, and they are associated with specific types of scenes. They include uh, the degree of naturalness, the degree of openness, the degree of roughness, the degree of expansion, and the basic colors. And it's easier for me to talk about these from examples, so I'm going to explain them with examples. So um, Oliva and Taralba, these global image features, if we look at these pictures, degree of naturalness, you can tell that the um, two pictures on the left have much more naturalness than the one on the right, which is clearly um, man-made buildings. The degree of openness, the one on the very left has the, is most open. The one in the middle is the most closed, or the least open. And the one on the right is kind of in between. We see some openness, but we also, it's closed off at the sides. The degree of roughness, the one in the right is uh, not at all rough, maybe a little bit on its right-hand side where the trees are. The one in the middle is very rough, okay? There's lots of um, different angled lines, and there's lots of little vertical lines, and there's lots of, there's just a lot going on. The one on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, the man-made scene is somewhere in between. There is some roughness to it, but it also has some areas that are not so rough. The degree of expansion, the one on the right, is really showing the most expansion. So when we have those parallel lines and they appear as they get farther away to kind of get closer together, that, that, is, that gives us this sense of depth and expansion that isn't really shown very well at all in the other two pictures. And then, of course, color. So beach scenes are going to have some uh, sand-looking beige, some maybe some green, but usually it's the beige and the blue or whatever ocean color, depending on whatever ocean you're close to. The forests are going to have brown and green, different browns and greens. And then the man-made, usually we see these kinds of grays, although it depends, and we can really distinguish things like adobe, that are adobe-style houses. That have the that have the color, but color tells us it's a global image feature that is associated with certain scenes. And I'm going to finish this up with instead of a summary slide of, of um, giving a nice summary, I'm going to kind of tell you what's happening next. So 
Perceiving the gist of a scene, we, we use physical and semantic regularities. We're going to be talking about that and how we use these physical and semantic regularities to comprehend, to, to perceive scenes, as well as to perceive objects within scenes. And it'll start to sound a little bit like bottom-up versus top-down processing as those physical regularities. Um, there's some top-down processing there of what we expect, but there's also some that's very bottom-up oriented of what's what we, what's out there semantic regularities are very much top-down processing right of what we um, from our experience and background knowledge what we expect to see in a particular scene is going to what we those objects and what we see will influence where we expect objects to be and how we perceive these scenes